Hi. Hello. They should, uh, the other people should be here in a few minutes. Yeah. Sounds good. I was expecting Brendan to be the one uh, in charge of letting me in, because oh. that's what Greta's email thread convinced oh. me. Okay, well, maybe he's not here yet. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad someone, someone's here, so thank you. Yeah, sure. Do you think I could try a screen share already to see if... Uh... Sure, yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, so it says host has disabled, so. Oh, let me see. Uh, um, let's see, so maybe if I make you a co-host or something. Sure thing, thank you. Ah. Okay, so I'll resume the recording. Uh, welcome everyone to the USC Combinatoric Seminar. Uh, we are very happy to have all the way from Hawaii, Vasu Tevari, who will talk about an algebra of Kliatchko and McDonald's reduced word identity. Go ahead. Okay, so, so thank you, Greta, for, for the introduction and the invitation. Um, and, and thank you all for coming. Um, right, so, so I'm, I'm excited to talk about some, some joint work with my uh, Fantastic collaborator Philippe Nadeau, uh, who's here from Lyon, uh, braving, fighting against sleep at 11 p.m. I guess. So, and, and the title is uh, an algebra of Klerschko and McDonald's that used word identity. Okay, so here's an outline of sorts. I, I want to talk about two specific identities, uh, one of McDonald and the other by Klerschko. Okay, and, and I think the former uh, is maybe more famous, famous in double quotes. Uh, in the combinatorics community, okay? And then I'll, I'll switch gears and I'll talk about two algebraic entities. Uh, one we call the q Kliatchko algebra, um, and the other one is an algebraic operation we call Q-divided symmetrization, yeah? And, and it will so happen um, that, sorry. Yeah, it will so happen that these two operations are best studied by the sequence of numbers which, which are pretty uh, interesting, and we call them uh, remixed Eulerian numbers. And, and I'll, I'll dwell on the name a little bit. And then I'll eventually close by touching upon the three things I mentioned in the abstract, hopefully. Okay, so, so I might have stretched myself thin, uh, but, but stop me with questions, and hopefully we'll get through a good chunk of this. Okay. Um, oh, I see I'm co host as well, so I see who's in the waiting room. Okay. Um, and yeah, so, so our work is based off uh, two, two, two preprints uh, from. from last year and the year before. Uh, and and uh, we're hoping to put out uh, a couple more uh, in due course. Okay. No, no promises when. Um, okay, so, so let me get started. Oh. Right, um, so this is the first, first slide. I kind of want you to stare at these two expressions. Okay, so I don't want to bother too much with the jargon. There are two identities that I want to compare. Uh, one is McDonald's reduced word identity, right? So it takes, a Schubert polynomial and plugs in ones for all monomials, uh, all parameters that appear in the Schubert polynomial. And it's well known, um, well, McDonald proved in 91 that expands as the following sum over reduced words for your indexing permutation W. Okay, so, so some polynomial, you're plugging in ones and out comes the identity, this expression on the right hand side, and you're just multiplying the indices that appear in your reduced word, summing it and dividing out by the uh, factorial of the length. Okay, and, and of very, in a very different setup is the following uh, identity. You have two varieties, the complete flag variety, and you have a special sub variety called the permutahedral variety. So the so perm sits inside uh, the flag variety. So you get, uh, you, you, you obtain a map on cohomology rings, okay, in the opposite direction the opposite direction of the inclusion. And without giving too much away, here's what this identity says. Start with the Schubert class. That is a basis element for the cohomology ring on the left here. Map it using this map iota star. And you get an expression in terms of these first churn classes uh, of, of line bundles corresponding to fundamental weights. Okay. so. All I want us to compare is you are multiplying I1 through IL on the top, and you're taking some products of these first churn classes 
indexed by I1 through IL, running over reduced words, and dividing by the same factorial. Okay, so clearly there's a parallel here, uh, and, and we, we got curious about was there a way to arrive at McDonald's identity uh, starting from Klyachko? And, and you notice the dates. Klyachko's work is in 1985. Uh, he wasn't really interested in counting pipe dreams. That's what the expression on top counts. Okay, so, so there's some work to be done in trying to bridge the gap between, uh, between the two identities. Okay. So, so this is what got us in, into this business of the Klyachko algebra, uh, which is where all these computations lie. Okay. So yeah, I'll, I'll expand on some of these terms later. Nope, this is not moving forward. Right, so here's the Q Klyachko algebra. Um, my, my field K is going to be Q or join this parameters uh, lowercase Q. This algebra is going to be generated by parameters uh, u1 through un variables modulo or subject to this relation. Okay, ui squared times q plus one. You can replace this by square free monomial ui ui minus one and ui ui plus one. Okay, and I'll, I'll interpret the boundary terms u naught and un to equal zero. Okay, so, so what Klarchko was, the algebra that Klarchko is utilizing is actually the case Q equals one. Okay. And, and it shouldn't be a surprise uh, given this relation that you can get rid of squares that a basis for this algebra is indexed by subsets. Okay. The subsets of N minus one, uh, this is the monomial U sub S. Okay, so this is a basis, it's a finite dimensional due to the whatever N minus one, right? And this particular map that we'll be interested in, it starts in the polynomial ring in X1 through Xn, and it performs a certain substitution. It replaces X sub i with ui minus ui minus one, okay? In particular, do remember that u naught and un are still zero. So the only variables that you see are u1 through un minus one. Okay, um, and given the basis, any polynomial of degree exceeding n happens to become zero when you interpret it under this morphism. Okay, so here's where things get interesting. If you have something of degree n minus one and you apply this morphism, then you expect to land in degree n minus one in the u's. There's only one basis element. So there's one more number that you wanna pick and we'd like to understand this number. And, and for good measure, I'm gonna scale this number by the Q analog, uh, the Q factorial, oh, N minus one Q factorial, right? So this is the Q analog of the usual factorial. And that's what I'll call this coefficient top sub N of F. Okay, so I'll start with the polynomial in the X's, I'll apply this morphism, I'll get something that's a multiple of U1 through UN minus one. That coefficient is what I'm interested in. So here's an example. Um, start here, you have two relations to use and you see that you have to perform some division, right? So you have to solve a system. Uh, you solve for U1 squared U2 uh, in terms of U1, U2, U3, and, and you realize that this top sub four is gonna be one plus Q. Okay, so I'm, I'm utilizing the relation and uh, right. So I replaced X1 by U1 x1 plus x2 is u2, okay? So, so this is what happens. Any questions? Okay, so let me jump onto something that looks completely different, right? Um, this is fairly gnarly, right? It doesn't look very appealing. Uh, we call this q-divided symmetrization. Um, let me just explain this. You start with the polynomial f, you hit it with this um, product, which fairly van der Monde, right? And it looks like a van der Monde determinant, except the indices uh, differ by at least two. Uh, divided by the honest van der Monde and similar price. Okay, so some algebraic operation, um, nobody knows why one would think of this, but hey, it tends to give some interesting uh, values. Okay, so some basic observations um, being this is actually, if you start with the polynomial, you get a symmetric polynomial with coefficients in the field K. 
This time, everything less than degree n minus one ends up vanishing. Okay, so compare with the case of Klebsko, everything above degree n, uh, larger than degree n was vanishing. Here, things below degree n are vanishing. Luckily, the degree n minus one still survives in both instances, and we get a number or an entity in the ground field. Okay, so if degrees n minus one, I get an element in Q adjoin uh, Q. Okay. And, and why did we cook this operation up? Well, the Q equals one case was already uh, studied a little bit, uh, or a fair bit by Postnikov and his work on volume polynomials. Same F as before, but this time, if you divide it symmetrized over the 24 permutations, it's a little bit of work. Um, and, and it's kind of magical to see the final result is gonna be one plus Q this time as well. Okay, which uh, recall is uh, the earlier computation, which I did earlier, right? Okay. And, and indeed, this is what happens, right? If you hand me a polynomial, you could ask me to divide it symmetrize with that uh, ugly expression, or you could ask me, pass it under the morphism Xi going to Ui minus Ui minus one, extract the coefficient of U1 through Un minus one. And, and the theorem says these two acts are the same, okay? Um, and, and really the question should be, what's the point of this theorem, right? I've got two operations. One looks clearly uh, uglier than the other. Um, and, and I'm trying to say that, okay, this, this ugly expression on the left happens to be this much nicer expression on the right-hand side. Okay. And, and as it so happens, what we were interested in was naturally looking like the left-hand side. So it started in this ugly land and we had to parse it into this other universe to actually get a handle uh, on this expression. So, so in the remaining um, 30 odd minutes or 40 odd minutes, I'll try and convince you that uh, there's some value to studying either of these uh, left-hand side and right-hand side. Okay, so, so these are this intriguing family of polynomials, right? So there's this family of polynomials that arises naturally on both sides and, and really uh, tells you how to connect the two, right? The previous theorem that I just stated relies on this family of polynomials. Um, and, and just some setup, this family of polynomials is gonna be indexed by sequences of length n minus one, summing to n minus one, okay? So non-negative integers summing to n minus one. And, and you, you probably wanna try and relate it with the uh, relations in the Clarchko algebra, okay? If any of these CIs happens to exceed two, I can do one of two things, or I can do both in fact. I could either transfer one deduct CI by one and increment the part before by one, that's a plus one minus one, or I could deduct CI by one and increment the part right after and bump it up by one. Okay, and uh, the L's and the R's are supposed to tell you whether are you headed to the left or you are uh, headed towards the right. Okay, and if you're on the fringes, uh, if you jump out of the window, I leave that term undefined. So yeah, starting from a non-negative sequence, you can pick uh, CI and, and transfer one to either the left or the right. Okay, so these two operations suffice um, to somehow introduce this uh, family of polynomials, okay? So here's the theorem uh, slash definition, in fact. Um, there's a unique family of polynomials subject to these relations. The first is the normalization relation. If all parts were one, there were no transitions that you could perform. Uh, and, and hence, I'm gonna take that as my base case and declare it to be the N minus one factorial, the Q analog. Otherwise, well, there's perhaps a part of length uh, like greater than two, then I can pick that part and use this sort of relation. Q plus one times A sub C, this Q will be attached to the L sub I, and this one is attached to the R sub I. Okay, so you get um, relations of this sort, um, and it's not immediate that you know, things will eventually collapse to hand you a polynomial with integral coefficients. 
and in fact, uh, non-negative natural numbers, right? So I could replace the Z by N and that theorem is indeed a theorem. Yeah. So yeah, so, so this cryptic definition defines a family of polynomials. Uh, it turns out to be a fairly uh, interesting family. Okay, so just an example, uh, just being done so that you, you if, if you are keeping track of all the computations I've performed, which I, I sure hope you are, no, um, then this should look familiar. Okay, so I start with A210. The L of this, uh, if I pick I equals one, the L's undefined, but R lands me here. So that's the first relation. And if, um, well, I still can't solve it, right? So I start with the second relation and I transfer this to bump it to the left. That's Q times A210, move one to the right, and that's A11. A11 one is, is something that I know, right? That's the base case. So I solve, I get this rational function, which is uh, happily a polynomial. And the same polynomial that we have encountered two times now. Okay, so this mixed volume number happens to be one plus two. Okay, so this is actually the, the, the theorem that we prove. If you start with a special family of polynomials of this form, right? X1 to the C1, X1 plus X2 to the C2 and so on, then you can show that this remixed Eulerian number happens to both be the divided symmetrization and the top coefficient. Okay, so both of those operations that I referred to earlier, one in the q Klatchko algebra and the other one in this um, universe involving symmetric functions, uh, symmetric, sorry, permutations acting on rational functions, all of those acts combine together to compute the remixed Eulerian number in this specific case. Okay, and, and, and the proof's not too bad, right? At least that this A, C's, A sub C's are this top coefficient is, is pretty immediate. You compare the relations of the q Klatchko algebra and you compare the relations satisfied by the A sub C's, they look very similar. But the first equality here is a bit of work, okay? So what we do is we essentially show that uh, the first expression satisfies the same relations and hence determines this family of polynomials. Okay. Okay. Right, so I want to dwell a little bit on the name. Um, I'll, I'll make this brief and breezy. So why the term mixed? Well, it comes from mixed volumes. Okay, so if you have polytopes living inside n-dimensional space, you can take them in Kowski sum. Right, so you can add vectors belonging to each of these polytopes and uh, take this uh, new thing called the Minkowski sum. Uh, and I can scale each of these polytopes by these parameters and look at its Euclidean volume, okay? This Euclidean volume happens to be a polynomial in the Y sub i's with coefficients called mixed volumes. Okay, so the Euclidean volume expands with coefficients cut, uh, being mixed volumes, okay? So here's an example. Uh, there's a triangle, that's my polytope one. There's a line segment, that's my polytope two. I take the Minkowski sum, which means I translate essentially all points here by this line segment, and I end up getting this trapezoid. Um, no surprise is that you can compute the volume of Y1, P1 plus Y2, P2 by, by high school geometry, uh, and you learn that you have half Y1 squared coming from the triangle, and Y1, Y2 coming from this uh, parallelogram in magenta. So, Mixed volume of P1, P1, coefficient of Y1 squared, one half. P1, P2, one. And P2, P2 is zero, and you saw this coming, right? This is a one dimensional object in two dimensional space. If you add it to itself, you get something of measure zero. So that's the zero, okay? In general, if all arguments are the one polytope itself, you get the honest volume, okay? And mixed volume in numbers, are a special case of this mixed volume business. You start with what are called hypersimplices, uh, which happen to be, you know, the sums of these indicator vectors. So you pick your subset, 
You take all standard basis vectors indexed by elements in that subset, take that as a point, take the convex hull. If you are considering all K element subsets, and that's the hypersimplex. Uh, and, and Postnikov's mixed volume numbers were mixed volumes of hypersimplices. And then you multiply by the n minus one factorial. This is usual factorial. And you get this positive integer called mixed volumes. And, and why Eulerian? Uh, in a very special case where most of these multiplicities are zero. Oh, there's supposed to be a zero here as well. Sorry. Uh, this one to the n minus k minus one should have been a zero. Okay. You, you end up counting classical Eulerian numbers, which are counting permutations according to descents. So this number in the middle, if you can see my pointer, it's permutations in S sub n minus one with k minus one descents. The number of zeros in the front tells you the number of descents you are trying to pick from the set of permutations. And uh, this is supposed to be the volume of the kth hypersimplex. Yeah. And, and wh why the term remixed? Well, the sign of times, right? Um, if you plug in Q equals one in R polynomials, you, you recover Postikov's mixed Eulerian numbers. Okay, so, so for lack of creativity, uh, we, we just went with remixed Eulerian numbers. And well, here we are. So, so the hope would be to shed some more light on usual mixed Eulerians and, and maybe connect it with other things. Okay, so, right. So that's my uh, goal in, in very terse terms. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about this from the probabilistic perspective first. Uh, and, and this will sound very familiar if you understood the relations um, that I used earlier. So here's a particle process. There's a set of sites indexed by Z. On each site, I can place a non-negative number of particles up top. And I'm gonna place finitely many particles. And this is the state of my uh, probabilistic model. And the transition is take the particle, either move to the right with probability one over one plus Q or move to the left with probability Q over one plus Q and then reach a new state. Okay, so simple enough process. Um, and when, when is this not possible? Well, if you have a single particle at site. Okay, so, so just, just going back, sorry. This transition only happens if C sub i exceeds two. Okay, very much like the square becoming uh, two square free terms. Um, so yeah. So here's the model, you start from a configuration, run this process, uh, eventually with uh, a probability one, things will converge to uh, a stable state. And uh, you, you realize that it doesn't matter in what, pro with what order you do this act of transferring. Like you could do this in any order and the answers, uh, the eventual probabilities won't change. So here's a process um, which uh, starts with three particles on site one. Step one, this guy on top jumps to the left or to the right. That's two, that's one level of my recursion. This is not a stable state because I have two particles here. Okay, each of those, you have two choices again. Either this thing up top descends to the left and then it's stable or it performs a walk here, it reaches here, it could bounce back and forth, but it will eventually reach this configuration with this probability. And similarly, you could start here, um, perform a random walk. This is an asymmetric random walk on a one-dimensional lattice. And you're trying to exit to the left or to the right. This exits to the left, this exits to the right, and these are the probabilities. Uh, and, and maybe those numbers look familiar to you, right? Each of those numbers, in fact. Um, I will be interested for cosmetic reasons, uh, when all particles find themselves in positions one, this blue dot is the one, two, and three. Okay, and, and this probability is in fact a mixed, uh, well, the numerator is a remixed Eulerian number. Okay, so that's the statement that I have, that you start from a state C, where C is the composition C1 through Cn minus one. You run this process, and, and then you look in the window where all particles are in the sites from one through n minus one. Okay. 
if you compute that probability, uh, that probability is going to be this remix to Euler number divided by the Q analog of uh, n minus one factorial. Okay. So yeah, so this probability process computes mixed Euler numbers when you specialize Q equals one. Um, and, and really this goes back to Diaconis and Fulton and, and goes by the name internal diffusion limited aggregation. Um, and, and the one that I described is, is really due to Fedor Petrov uh, in his paper from 2015. Okay. And, and the proof is, is dead easy. You just follow your nose essentially. And the probability of reaching a particular state satisfies this transition equation. Looks kind of like the equation satisfied by the mixed Eulerian numbers. And uh, yeah, you check that this uh, particular number satisfies all the right, uh, has the right properties. Okay, um, questions? Okay. So let me just discuss two more special cases to tell you that uh, numbers that you care about uh, do show up in this setting. Um, if you started from a configuration where all particles were either on the left extreme and the remaining particles were on the right extreme, then your only option to land in the interval one through n minus one is things on the left collapse to the right, things on the right collapse to the left, and they cover up this interval. Okay? So that's the only way you can see one through n minus one uh, as your stable state. Yeah, so, so you get, if you calculate these probabilities of exiting to the right and exiting to the left, you see products of factorials in the denominator and you eventually get this Q binomial coefficient for this specific case. Okay, so this is a Q binomial coefficient. Um, right, so the probabilistic process makes this fairly transparent. On the other hand, had you started with zeros on the left, zeros on the right, and a single part in between, then you have the option of jumping in both directions. But uh, when, when you're done descending to stable state, uh, you, you're actually just tracking the major index over permutations with k minus one descents. Okay, so this, this is generalization of uh, Postnikov's mixed volume uh, or Laplace's mixed volume result from the start. You're getting Q to the match instead of the number one. Yeah. So this is a Q Eulerian polynomial uh, of uh, Carlitz McMahon. Uh, could you remind me actually what was the transition rule for the probabilities? I'm just curious uh, sure thing. what it is yeah, yeah. for uh, Q, is, Q equals one. Oh, so it's one half, one half. Okay, great. Okay, so, so yeah, so it's a symmetric random walk being, uh, yeah. Sorry, is that what you're looking for? Yeah. 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 So you start with I and you transfer with equal probabilities left to right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, and, and I want to discuss one more um, curious property, which I call the cyclic sum rule. Um, and, and this is um, nice, um, or at least nice to us. Um, I'll call two sequences um, similar. If I append a zero, and one of the sequences happens to be a rotation of the other sequence. Okay. So for instance, two one zero is similar to zero two one, because if you take the cyclic class after appending the zero, you do see zero two one in this cyclic set. And I want to look at the set of all sequences of length n minus one summing to n minus one modulo this equivalence relation. The cycle lemma tells you that you uh, expect Catalan many classes. Right? And, and Catalan many classes, so, so that, that's um, not, not, not so surprising. Uh, what, what is surprising is if you sum these remixed Eulerian numbers over a class, okay, then you get the uh, n minus one factorial, the Q analog. Okay? So that's that's the uh, neat little identity, and you re you realize that the proof is not that bad. Okay, instead of working this uh, particle process on a lattice, you close it to a ring with n sites. Since there are n minus one particles in a stable state, one of the sites is going to be vacant. And now use the cyclic symmetry to compute uh, all the remixed Eulerian numbers uh, in this cyclic orbit and the probability sum to one. So that translates to the fact that the sum of the remix tolerant numbers is n minus one factorial. Okay. And, and uh, again, for Q equals one, this is, was conjectured by Stanley. 
uh, and, and Postnikov proved it uh, in his paper, uh, but his proof uses geometry, um, you know, the cyclic symmetry of the type A Dinkin diagram in fact. Okay, so you get him. All right, so, so let, let me return to, to what my original motivations were, uh, right, where is uh, McDonald's identity in, in all this? So, so let me try and attend to that in, in the remaining time. So, so maybe now is a good time for, for questions, if any, because I'm, I'm switching gears to an extent. Okay. Right, so, so I, I told you that we, we cared about divided symmetrization before we cared about Klatchko's algebra. Uh, and, and one of the reasons was uh, this work of uh, Dong Kwan Kim uh, from 2016, so he's, he's, he gave this expression for, for the class of a Deline lustig variety uh, attached to a Coxeter element. Um, and one, if one wants an explicit expansion for the class, the coefficient, you, you need to perform this Q divided symmetrization task to Schubert polynomials of the right degree. Okay, so here W has N minus one uh, length. Okay, so there's gonna be degree N minus one polynomial I want to apply that uh, fairly nasty looking rational function, symmetrize, compute, out pops the answer. Don Kwan already says that this is a polynomial with non-negative integer coefficients, right? So Kim's work already tells us that. So, so there's something interesting happening in, in this process uh, that one would like to, or we, would, we wanted to understand, okay? And given the theorems that I've told you, you can recast this computation in the Klyachko algebra, right? You start with the Schubert polynomial, you replace the X sub i's with ui minus ui minus one and extract the top coefficient. And, and that looks like a far more reasonable computation to perform. Okay, so I, I really want to understand Schubert polynomials under this transformed alphabet, differences of alphabets, uh, difference of variables, my apologies. And to, to make life easy, I, I just work in what we call uh, uh, the full Klyachko algebra. Okay, I, I will not want to restrict myself to n minus one variables. I'll just work with variables indexed by the integers. Okay, so this is the, the, the bi-infinite uh, Q Klyachko, um, if you will. Same relations, this time there's no, no boundary, right? You just got uh, relations indexed by Z. Um, for me, perhaps more interesting is its positive half, uh, which is obtained by truncating, right? So annihilating everything uh, which has index i less than equal to zero. Okay. And, and no surprises, I guess, a basis for both of these algebras is given by u sub, a finite subset of the uh, integers uh, or the positive integers in the case of k plus. Okay. Right, so this is the algebra that I, I'm gonna be interested in now. K sub n also sits inside here. You just have to kill a whole bunch of variables. So you see a restricted picture if you uh, truncate the alphabet. Okay, so, so why one would care about the positive half? one realizes that this particular specialization, sending the u sub i to the q analog of i, perfectly fits the relations of the algebra. Okay, the algebra one plus q u i squared equaling blah, everything checks out once you perform the specialization. Okay, this uh, specialization does not work in the finite algebra. Okay, so you, you have to go allow yourself enough wiggle room to be able to perform the specialization, which is why we moved to this uh, bi-infinite algebra in the first place. Okay, so the positive half behaves well with respect to principal specialization. And then one would hope uh, the natural hope. Okay, prove identities in the positive half, principal specialization, get a Q identity, uh, which might, might not be interesting. And uh, now you can probably see this coming. I, I want to understand how the Schuberts under my morphism look like in the positive half. If I get a nice enough expression, 
I would like to be able to deduce uh, McDonald's reduced word identity by performing uh, this spiritual specialization. All right, so that's that's the that's why we started working with this uh, algebra in the first place. Um, okay, so quick quick reminder of sorts for a Schubert polynomial. Um, you know, so I'll just do this by by pictures. Right, so to, to define a Schubert polynomial, you need to hand me a permutation. One, four, three, two is the one I've picked. And Schubert polynomials are sums of monomials indexed by reduced pipe dreams. Okay, and, and what's a reduced pipe dream? Well, you start with the staircase uh, four, three, two, one, and you will place uh, one of two pieces, right? Either these crosses, these blue crosses, or these red elbows, okay? And the way you're supposed to place them is uh, so that if you were to follow strands, the four gets mapped to a four, uh, the three gets mapped to a three, the two goes to a two, and the one goes to a one, okay? If each of these strands intersects at most once, right? So if any two strands you pick, they probably leave at most once, that's a reduced pipe ring. So here's a reduced pipe dream for the permutation uh, I picked, one, four, three, two. Um, and the attached monomial records the rows of the crossings. So crossing in row one, x sub one, crossing in row two, x sub two, crossing in row three, x sub three. Okay, so that's the uh, monomial attached to the reduced pipe dream. Yeah. And then once you've done this, uh, the, the next step is, is probably not so surprising in combinatorics. You take the generating function for these weights. So I look at the set of all reduced pipe dreams for a fixed permutation. Each of them contributes a monomial. I add all these monomials and out pops the Schubert polynomial, uh, S sub W in the variables, X1 through X. Okay. And in fact, you realize that if you work in SN, the Schubert polynomial only sees uh, variables up until Xn minus one. And the all one specialization, Right, so this was going all the way back to the first slide. If you specialize all variables equal to one, you are counting reduced pipe dreams. But on the other hand, if you remember uh, McDonald's reduced word identity at the very beginning, you have an expression for it, uh, which runs over all reduced words. Okay, so that's a formula to count pipe dreams, let's say. Okay. Um, Okay, so, so let me march ahead and now um, move towards combining Klatchko and McDonald uh, into one identity. Okay. So here's the data I will need. Uh, red of W is simply the set of reduced expressions. So write your permutation as a product of simple transpositions in, in the shortest manner, uh, that's a reduced expression. For any reduced expression, I can count the number of times every simple transposition participates, okay? So if S1 appears twice, then the first index would be a two and so on, okay? So these C sub i's are constants, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. They are counting instances, sorry, C sub j because i is used, right? Yeah, C sub j is counting the number of times the simple transposition S sub j appears in my chosen reduced expression, okay? Um, and, and I define the comage corresponding to this reduced word to be the sum of all j's where your reduced word goes up, okay? So anytime you see an ascent in the reduced word, you, you add, you track that index, you add it and out pops uh, the comage or index, okay? So if this was a reduced expression, oh, that is a typo. Um, then there are two ones, so that's the two. There's one two, that's the one. And there's one instance each of three and four, that's the one and the one and the zero. Okay. And the co-major index tracks the ascents. So one going to two, ascent one, one going to four, ascent at position three. So the co-match is four. Okay, 
so, so this is uh, our proposed uh, generalization for the two identities at the very start. Okay, if you take your permutation in SN uh, and then transform the Schubert polynomial according to the, the morphism uh, X sub I going to the difference of the U's, then the entire expression collapses to this positive, right? The positive uh, sum. So each of the reduced words contributes a composition, a weak composition C that determines this monomial. And there's a Q weight coming from the co-major index. Okay, so one can, one can show that uh, this identity indeed holds. Uh, and at Q equals one, it becomes Klyashko's identity. Okay. So here's an example. If you pick three, two, one uh, inside the symmetric group, then the attached Schubert polynomial is in fact X one squared X two. Okay, so there's two reduced words for this. Uh, this one has two ones and, and one, two, that's the composition two one. Well, I've, I've got that thing twice, but that should be a two one two and a one two one. Uh, and that's the composition one two. And if you were to start from x one squared x two, replace x one by u one, x two by u two minus u one, you will eventually get this expression on the right hand side. So, so yeah, so this is the, the identity we proved. And um, as an immediate corollary, because of the compatibility of principal specialization uh, in the positive, right? So I have the identity in K plus. I can send each of these U's to the analogous Q integer. The differences translate to recording individual powers of Q's and these become the Q integers on the right hand side. Okay. So this Q Klatchko McDonald reduces to the Q McDonald just by the fact that uh, uh, the relations of the positive Klatchko algebra are compatible with principal specialization. Okay. So this record was the uh, Q McDonald identity, which already has a bunch of proofs, right? Pomin Stanley had their first proof, which is pretty much what we, we follow. Klyachko's proof would not generalize. And so there are two things with Klyachko's proof. One, the 85 paper doesn't have a proof. Uh, then he published a paper in 95 with the proof in Russian. So thanks to Google Translate, we were able to understand uh, piece the proof together. Uh, but sadly, the Q doesn't fit very well in his setup. Uh, but luckily for us, uh, Fomin and Stanley had already done the heavy lifting and we just had to do the right tweaks to incorporate the Klyachko algebra into their setup. Okay. Is there supposed to be a fact Q factorial on the theorem at the top? Oh, indeed, yes. Okay. Great. Did I already miss it? Yes, there is supposed to be. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, thank you. All right, so yeah, so that thing wasn't coming out of nowhere. Uh, it's supposed to be an exact replica of the identity I had at the very beginning. Thanks. Okay, so, so you've got a common generalization to both Klatchko and McDonald with a Q. Uh, by working in this positive cloud card. Okay. And remember uh, Donkon Kim's structure constants, the specific Delin Lustig variety? Well, now we can describe them using uh, remix to Eulerian numbers. Okay. So I, I know how to perform a divided symmetrization. Um, sorry, each of these U's is going to give me a mixed to Eulerian number. And the Q to the co match goes for a ride, and that's it. Okay. So this n minus one is the length of the permutation, which, which Brendan kindly pointed out was missing. And the remaining expression is obtained by replacing the U's with the A sub C and the Q match uh, piggybacks. Okay. What's curious though is the fact that these are polynomials with non negative integer coefficients. Okay. From this rational function expression, it's quite the mystery. I, 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 I wouldn't say, uh, or maybe we wouldn't say that we understand this entirely yet. So there's, there's a lot of uh, magical uh, cancellation happening uh, when you compute these uh, linear ex expressions on the right-hand side. 
Okay. And and of course, Q equals one uh, is what we, Philippe and I, um, had done in summer 2020. Um, you compute the class of the permetohedral variety. If you specialize Q equals one, you still get fractions that magically become a positive integer, right? So even in the case Q equals one, I don't think we understand the story uh, as well uh, as we would like. Though we can't do, say, we can't say a whole lot, especially with vexillary permutations and, and such. Okay, questions. All right, so um, in the final uh, five or 10 minutes or so, I wanna discuss um, a special case. I mean, sure polynomials is what one cares about, especially uh, the Grassmannian case. Uh, and then I'll close with uh, quasi-symmetric polynomials. Okay, so the A, -dub A sub W, which is the Q divided symmetrization of a Schur polynomial if W is Grassmannian. Okay, uh, remember M Grassmannian means, uh, Grassmannian means you have at most one descent and M Grassmannian means your descent is at position M. Okay. So I'm gonna pick an M Grassmannian element uh, of length N minus one. And, and with Grassmannian elements, you can naturally attach partitions by looking at the code of the permutation and sorting it to get a partition. Okay, so you get this partition lambda sub w, and and our theorem says if you wanted to look at these um, the structure polynomial a w q, you would be summing q to the maj over all tableau of shape lambda sub w with a fixed number of descents. Okay, so this is kind of sounding like the, the Euler in numbers uh, that I mentioned earlier, okay? And, and just a quick reminder, uh, the major index for a standard Young tableau is the sum of all entries i, such that i plus one happens to be up above, okay, in a row strictly <sighs> above. Um, all right, uh, okay. So here's, here's a quick example. Um, I've picked the permutation one, four, six, two, three, five. The descent is in position three. So this is three Grossmannian. And, and the code when sorted gives the permutation three comma two. Okay. So I'll be looking at tableau of the shape three, two with exactly three minus one equals two descents. Okay, so there's three of them. The first one contributes maj one plus three, four. The second one contributes two plus four, six. And the third one contributes maj one plus four, that's three. Okay. So these, these sums of Q to the major indices or a fixed number of descents uh, show up as AWQ with W plus one in other words. Okay. So, so yes, the Schur function case happens to be particularly nice. Um, and, and this appearance of tableau with descents should, should at least hint to you that uh, maybe quasi-symmetric polynomials uh, are at the background uh, of this result or, or could be uh, you know, woven into this perspective. And indeed that is the case. Quasi-symmetric polynomials also work very nicely when interpreted in this classical algebra. Okay. So let me just give you a crash course um, quasi symmetric polynomials indexed by compositions. So alpha one through alpha M, all positive integers. I can take all monomials X sub I one to the alpha one all the way through X sub I M to the alpha M for all increasing uh, set of indices I one through I M. Okay, so here's three, one, two. Uh, observe the subscripts always strictly increasing all observe the exponents, always three, one, two, red, left to right. So this is the monomial quasi-symmetric polynomial. Um, and there's a typo that I was told to fix. Oh, well, um, the fundamental quasi-symmetric polynomials can be obtained uh, by the, uh, from the monomial quasi-symmetric polynomials. Uh, all you need to do is take your composition and break it into fragments, okay? Any part that can be broken, break it, so the three is the only thing that can be decomposed. It either stays as three 
It either decomposes as one, two, or two, one, or it decomposes into three fragments, one, one, one. Okay, so this is the fundamental quasi symmetric polynomial um, given monomial quasi symmetric polynomials. Okay, so uh, the Kliatchka algebra, again, a, a nice meeting place for various families of polynomials. Any fundamental quasi symmetric polynomial, if you make this, uh, take this image under this morphism, then you get a single monomial. Okay. And the single monomial is actually going to be indexed by an interval, which is going to be a translate of the interval one through n minus one. Okay. There's this power. Let's ignore it. That's not what's important. My point is you start with the fundamental quasi symmetric polynomial, a whole ton of monomials, make the u substitution, and everything collapses except a single interval. And this is kind of why uh, fundamental quasi symmetric polynomials also tend to behave nicely with the principal specialization business uh, I have been on about. Okay. Yeah, and uh, as soon as you forget all the variables larger than n, this thing on the right collapses to zero. So fundamental quasi symmetric polynomials become zero if you work in the finite Kliatch Okay. So here's the the final result, uh, if you wanted to study Q divided symmetrization, then fundamental quasi symmetric polynomials are either a power of Q or zero. And they're a power of Q if and only if the number of variables happens to be the length of the composition. Okay, so zero or power of Q. And what this tells you in particular is you can take principle, truncated principle specializations of fundamental, oh, of quasi symmetric functions. That's the left hand side. That's going to be a rational generating function. It's a well studied rational generating function. What does the numerator track? The numerator actually tracks the Q divided symmetrization. And you have a poor commerce symbol in the bottom. So, yeah, so this is what the Kratzko algebra tells you. You can actually compute uh, principle specializations of quasi symmetric functions as well. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, so let me just quickly um, give you a, a sense of what else uh, we, we intend to eventually finish. Um, we do have a positive, manifestly positive interpretation for the remix to Eulerian numbers. Um, we have what we call a cyclic sum rule akin to the one I presented for remix to Eulerian numbers, for Schubert's. Okay. Um, and, and then we have a, a, a nice criteria for, you know, when, when do polynomials end up behaving nicely uh, when you have these principal specializations going on? So the Schubert's are, are one class, specific Schubert's. Uh, fundamental quasi symmetric polynomials are another class. And we kind of unify the two uh, under uh, one umbrella. And, and then what we have is also, um, Going back to Postnikov's work, we have a Q parameter introduced in his volume polynomial as well. Okay, so we have Q volumes, uh, which we are working on understanding better. Okay. So on that note, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vasu. Thank you. I'll stop recording.